Greetings, everybody. I'm Nick DiVirgilio, and I am more than excited and super honored to be here in Ridgeland, South Carolina at the Gretsch factory to see how the magic is done and how these beautiful drums are made. Join me. I've been a Gretsch fan since I was a kid. I was a huge Phil Collins and Tony Williams fan growing up, and when I was about 15 years old, I begged my father to get me a Gretsch drum kit, and I finally got one in 1984. I got a Tony Williams yellow lacquer Gretsch drum kit. And now, Sweetwater has been fortunate enough to be invited down here to the factory in Ridgeland, South Carolina to discover how they get that great Gretsch sound. As the crew and I arrive in sunny Savannah, Georgia, we fueled up with a bit of grub while taking in the city's indelible vibes. Fred Gretsch himself texts me, suggesting we tour the Gretsch Museum. At the epicenter of Gretsch's 140 year history, we're steeped in decades of iconic Gretsch gear. The perfect place to get inspired for my meeting with Fred. You can find the museum in downtown Savannah's Plant Riverside District, a vibrant locale that's perfect for taking in local culture. What a fantastic kickoff in Savannah. I think I'm ready to talk to Fred. Fred Gretsch, thank you so much for taking the time to, to speak with us today. Uh, this is really cool to, to be sitting here with you. Yeah, you're, you're welcome, and, and welcome to the Gretsch studio in Pooler, Georgia. We've been at this location since 1990, 33 years. Wow, time flies. We call it the Gretsch studio, but it, but it is really the headquarters of the Gretsch family right. uh, office. Uh, uh, for, for, for the world. And yeah. from here, we serve a worldwide audience of musicians, music lovers, artists, and fans. That's awesome. Now, we were talking at breakfast about the legacy. It's the 140th anniversary for Gretsch. Yeah, what, what a great history it is. Go, go, going back to uh, Mannheim, Germany in the 1850s, uh, uh, great, great granddad had 12 kids. Uh, right in the middle was my, my great grandfather. Uh, uh, Friedrich Gretsch, uh, born 1856, uh, emigrated to Brooklyn as a 16-year-old in 1872. Uh, learned the music business from the Hoodlet uh, banjo and drum business there in, in Brooklyn. Uh, married Grandma Rosa, uh, great Grandma Rosa, 1879. Grandpa was born in 1880, and, and, and so it was that family uh, and. Uh, Great granddad who started the music business 1883, 140 years this year, and, and we carry on that legacy. I didn't realize back in the day that the innovations that early Gretsch made back in the, in the early days were on the forefront of a lot of drum manufacturing and guitars. The, the first hoop and the first double bass drum kit, I mean, little things like this, but that made such an impact on the business, on the industry. Sure, sure, absolutely. So you, you go back a hundred years and, and, and Brooklyn was a happening industrial city right. uh, where, where the business was, was located. Uh, 1920s, uh, grandpa developed the uh, multiply uh, hoop first and then the shell. And at that point in time, all the drums were solid. Uh, yeah, steam uh, bent. So, so steam, steam bent and, and they were heavy and they tended to go out around and and by making a ply shell, they lightened up. Uh, they be became uh, much more, uh, 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 e e they were easily kept in round and also eased the tuning as well. So, so the fact that the multi-ply shell was created by uh, Fred Gretsch Sr. in the 20s, uh, uh, we, we know it and, and it's a family secret we want to tell the world. Yeah, I mean, that changed the whole landscape of drums. Right, 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 and, and die cast parts, which we use first in, in, in Gretsch banjos, uh, and the banjo business uh, in, in that uh, era was super important yeah. uh, before the guitar uh, came into its own, uh, and uh, used uh, die cast parts first with banjos and, and then with our drums, and, and of course they're a, a part of our recipe for, for drums from, from the late 20s uh, right through today. And those recipes, those shell recipes haven't changed. The, like the USA Customs with the maple gum wood and, and the broadcaster series, those are still made basically the same way to this day, aren't they? Uh, they, they are, and we uh, maintain a lot of accuracy of detail in order to maintain the quality of sound. And, uh, that great Gretsch sound, uh, we, we, we build it in and, and we want to keep it strong. About how old are some of these drums up here? I know, I mean, they got to date back quite a ways, don't they? 
Uh, up to 100 years old. Yeah. Each, each, each era has a different construction issue uh, that we could talk about. And, right. and a long, long story in every one of them. Can I point out the one you showed us a little bit earlier? I sure, think this is sure. really cool. Sure, <laughs> a, a, a mid 30s uh, drum, drum in, in, in two tone uh, finish with uh, uh, die cast hoops and uh, rocket, rocket lugs and neat thing looking that sound hole and, and uh, what you spy in there is a light bulb. <laughs> That's amazing, you can't see it with the camera, but there, there's a light bulb mounted on the inside of the drum uh, and that was to keep the head's tight. That, that, that's right. A little bit of heat kept the calf head tight when in, in uh, humid weather. Yeah, because plastic heads weren't invented for another sure. 20 years or that's so right. later, right? Yeah. yeah, 20 plus years later. Amazing. And that, was, and that was the rationale for plastic heads. They didn't, didn't sag. Right. Well, that's great news that all of this gear is going to be preserved in a nice setting at the, at the university. Sure, it's going to sure, be great. Sure. sure, sure. Uh, and the uh, Gretsch School of Music, uh, Fred and Donnie Gretsch School of Music, Georgia Southern University, uh, is receiving our collection of instruments and, and archive materials, and uh, we'll uh, keep it for our 99 years. So we made a 99-year agreement. That's a, that's a nice long deal. All right. All right. Now, this, this uh, the cat the, uh, the <laughs> <laughs> the shelves here are pretty amazing. If you're a fan of, of drumming like I am, I mean, just you have books with Phil Collins, Vinny Caliuta, Billy Gibson, George Harrison. So your your wife really put a lot of work into making these these archives. I mean, sure, it has sure. da, da, pictures da. and magazines and articles and just so much stuff. Yeah, Donna Gretsch is a, is a master archivist and, and organizer. This is her life's work here, uh, 44 plus years in the music business. Man. Uh, service to musicians, uh, music lovers, artists, yeah. and fans. Stephen Stills, Brian Setzer, Joe Perry, so many iconic players. Right, right. All, all the artists uh, yeah. that, that uh, have been associated with Gretsch in one way or another over, over many, many years. Yeah. Talk about great relationships in the industry. Let's go back 90 years. And, and, and what drummers can you, can, you, can you name from 90 years ago? Well, the one that Gretsch can name is Billy Gladstone. So, so 100 years ago, the internet of the day was the radio. And, and the, uh, the Rockefeller family uh, opened Radio City Music Hall. It was the music mecca of the world, 1932. The pr principal percussionist Billy Gladstone, so in Manhattan, across the river from Brooklyn, and and he was a frequent visitor, and we uh, uh, a gifted artist uh, uh, of the day. Fast forward uh, 15 years uh, after the war, uh, uh, Louis Belson uh, also performing in Manhattan, coming to visit, and sure. he, he he wanted big drums, he wanted double bass drums, and and, and we made it for him. And our, our artist uh, lead, uh, uh, Phil Grant. Uh, was very engaged as a player himself, uh, working with the artists in, in Manhattan in the village and in, in, in Harlem, inviting him to come to visit. And, and uh, a cool thing, uh, going back 100 years ago, uh, Grandpa, Fred Gretsch Sr., who, whose picture is uh, uh, on the wall here in the Gretsch studio, mm -hmm. uh, who first took me to the, visit the, the factory in Brooklyn in 1950, uh, he built the factory with his mom in 1916, that 10 story building there at 60 Broadway. He was uh, 36 years old when he completed the building. He registered the K Zildjian trademark in the United States, 1926. Wow, didn't know that. Uh, and Gretsch was the distributor of Turkish K Zildjian symbols. Okay. Uh, so, uh, added impetus for those cats who were playing drums, sure. drummers. Uh, of the 50s, you visit the Gretsch factory in Brooklyn, you tweak the kit that you're, that, that, that you're playing, and you pick out Zildjian cymbals, uh, K Zildjian cymbals, original K. So how's that for a big draw? That's a serious combination right there. Yeah. yeah, being on the forefront of what the artists wanted way back in the day, uh, going back 90 years ago, that's where maybe the, the profile and, uh, and the roadmap for working with artists really began. Here's a fun question. I was reading about the history of the Gretsch badge and it's changed over the years. Of all the badges that have come through this company, do you have a favorite, a look of the badge? <laughs> it might be a strange question, but do you have a favorite badge? Sure, sure. We're, we, 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 we're uh, debuting a, uh, a video later on next month. 
Round Badge stories. Okay. So, so everybody's got to be a, uh, behind Round Badge. Okay. Uh, and cer certainly the family is. Okay. Be being used nearly a hundred years ago, sure. uh, being the it's most the popular uh, badge of the day, uh, uh, Round Badge is where it's at. Nice. And I was wondering, what did you do? Because you were working for the company and then you sort of got out of the music sort of business for a while. Why are you waiting to try to buy the company back? I started in March of 65 at the Gretsch family business right. at, at 60 Broadway, Brooklyn, New York, and, and uh, working for my dad's older brother, Fred Gretsch Jr., who was a wonderful mentor to, to, to me in the business. Fred Jr., along with my dad, Bill, uh, led the business. Dad died in 48. Uh, so in, in, in 67, uh, Fred Jr. was uh, uh, 62 years old, and, and the business was booming. And just a couple of years earlier, Fender had been sold to CBS for a whole lot of money, and, and a lot of companies were changing hands. And he took the opportunity to, to sell the business to the Baldwin Piano Company, who but, but behind Steinway was the number two piano company in the world. And when he told me, I said, but I wanted to buy the business. And, and at that point, I'd been in it uh, two years full time. And he said, well, Baldwin had the money and they're a big company. And, and so they bought it. And in any case, I set a personal goal to buy it back again. It took 17 years to do it. But you did uh, it. And, but, I, but, but, I, but, I, but I did it. And, and, and uh, uh, my wife, Diana, uh, uh, runs the business with me today. Our oldest daughter, Lena, in the business 29 years. Uh, so. So uh, over 125 years serving the industry between the three of us. That's amazing. And that uh, you still have family involved is a, is a fantastic thing. Uh, uh, yes, and we, we, uh, we're blessed with a big family and uh, lots of uh, children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, and, and encouraging them to, uh, to support the Gretsch legacy as we have throughout our careers sure. is, 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 is something that we remind them about. Next up, Ridgeland, South Carolina, home to the Gretsch Factory, where every Gretsch USA drum is produced, from beginning concepts and ideation to the final product. I got the chance to sit down with Paul Cooper, Gretsch's Director of Operations, to explain just what it takes to make this magic happen. My name is Paul Cooper, I'm the Director of Operations, and uh, a week from Friday I'll have been here 25 years. Before Gretsch, I was actually a district manager for record stores. Okay. And that's how I met the Gretches. So Mrs. Gretch shopped in a store I had in Savannah. She hired the manager, then she hired the assistant manager. Then about six months after that, I got a call from Mr. Gretch, because he, he liked those guys so much he wanted to meet me. And had you, did you know anything about building drums before you started here? No, absolutely not. So yeah. uh, what was the first thing you had to learn? Well. When I started up here at the factory, I, I worked in the sales office down at Pooler for about 10 months before I came up to the factory. There was a gentleman named Gene Haw who had worked for Gretchen Baldwin since 1966. He was a consultant for Mr. Gretch, so he was here every couple of weeks, or every couple of, for a couple of weeks, every couple of months. And he taught me everything I knew how to do. But the first thing I ever did here was learn how to cut the, the whole in the bottom of a die cast snare hoop on a mill, milling machine. Gene told me I would mess up a bunch of them, and I certainly did. <laughs> so, took me a while to get that. But you've, you've, you've certainly gotten past that point. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I would say a large part of my job is keeping sure we maintain the old processes that we do. Not that anybody's really tried to come and tell us to do it differently, right. but there's been so many other things developed even in the last 25 years I've been here, that I think what people pay for is a Gretsch drum that's made the same way we made them in the 60s. And that's always been my goal here, is to continue that tradition. And to me, that's what makes a Gretsch drum, that's why they sound consistent, you know? Because they're made the same way. What's the process that these go through into making a Gretsch drum? What we do is we'll, we'll pick the customer's shells out and match the grain on them so they all look good, if it's a lacquer kit. Okay. First thing we'll do, we'll take them in the wood shop and we'll cut them to the, the tubes to the proper depth. Then we sand the inside, we'll putty the inside seam and then go back and revisit that. Then we start sanding the outside. Uh, we'll sand it with three different grit sandpapers. And we put it on this old, old machine that used to be at the Slingerland Niles factory. 
and we'll hand sand it with uh, 180 grit, and that's normally our final sanding. Uh, from there, if it's a, a stained and lacquer drum, we'll go and we'll hand stain it, old school, just wiping it on, wiping it off, let it dry, come back and do another coat. And, you know, it may take you half a day to stain a rack of drums, because some drums might take three coats, some might take six to get to the same color. Once we have the, the color on there, then we'll go and we'll spray a coat of sealer on it. Uh, after that, we'll sand it. Then the next day, generally, we'll start spraying nitrocellulose lacquer. We'll spray a coat, let it dry overnight. Spray a second coat the next day, let it dry overnight. Then we'll sand it. Then we'll continue that process of two coats and sanding until the lacquer looks right. Generally, it's six to eight coats for a gloss finish. For a satin finish, it's anywhere from five to six. Uh, once the drums have dried, which could be three days to three weeks, really depending upon the humidity here, okay. then we'll go and we'll wet sand them with 500 grit and 1,000 grit paper using a special formula of soap and water that we do. And uh, then we'll drill them, then we'll edge them, then we'll buff them, and we badge them, take them to assembly, and from then on, they get, the hardware gets put on and the heads get put on. And, and we inspect them, so. Right. I, mean, I guess I knew this, but sanding is such an important part of these drums in the final product. Yeah. You sand these drums a lot from the beginning. Well, all the way through, yeah. They, yeah. they get sanded in the wood shop, then they get sanded again in the spray room, and after they come out of the spray room, they get sanded. And then, of course, during the edging process, we're sanding that with three different grits of paper. So yeah, if, if, if you don't like sanding, you probably wouldn't like working here. <laughs> <laughs> right. And everybody that you work that works in the factory, I mean, they, it, it takes a lot of training to do it the sort of mm -hmm. the Gretsch way, right? I mean, you have to learn how to do it yeah. the right way. So, how long have most of the employees been here? Well, I've got uh, kind of three different stages of people. Okay. I've got the people like myself and Josh and Tanya and Barbara and Tammy who've been here anywhere from 19 to 25 to 30 years. Then I've got another group of people who've been here anywhere from 10 to 12 or 13 years. And then I've got uh, another group of people who are anywhere from three months, been here three months to three or four years. So, cool. kind of three waves of people right. all through the process. And do a lot of the employees, are they able to move from station to station or do they focus on one particular thing? Well, we have, we have more steps in the process than we have people. So cross training is a huge thing of what we do here. We, we, there may be one or two people that do the same thing all day here, uh, but everybody else moves around it and, and works either in different areas right. or different processes within the same area. Very cool. Yeah. Can you talk to us a little bit about the, uh, the relationship now with DW and Gretsch? Yeah. And what's that done for the Gretsch brand and the business of, of Gretsch? The DW people have been nothing but great for us. Uh, working for a company that's completely drum centric, uh, you know, they totally get it. Everything's about the drum. Uh, it's just the best thing I think that's ever happened to us, really, is being affiliated with them. It's funny because we're kind of the yin and yang of drum building. I always look at DW as a super innovative company coming out with new stuff all the time that is really groundbreaking. And where our whole idea is to continue making drums in the same rich history our company's always had, that Gretsch has always had. So, yes, when possible, we've improved machinery, we've replaced old machines, so DW has been great with that and that type of thing. Paul, can you tell us a little bit about the 140th anniversary and the drums you guys are building for that? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, for the 140th anniversary, I wanted to do something a little bit different, so uh, we came up with a hybrid shell. Right? In, in the past, well, in recent history, in the last 25 years, Gretsch has either, either used gum and maple for the USA customer or uh, maple and poplar for the Brooklyn and, and maple and poplar for the three-ply. So I wanted to take all those woods and put them together because they all sound very Gretschy. Mm -hmm. And it, it turned out that these kits are like Gretsch on steroids. I mean, they're really great sounding. Uh, for the finish, we wanted to do something we'd never really done before so we came up with a uh, it's like a light ebony to metallic black metallic gloss finish which just looks stunning every kit comes with a 
certificate of authenticity. And in the past, for the 120th anniversary, we've always had certificates that Mr. Gretsch and myself signed. Well, I thought it would be really cool to have certificates that all the employees signed. So with every kit, that certificate has every employee's signature on it. And the labels inside the drum have different employees' signatures on it. For me, it was just a way of involving the crew a little bit more because with, without those people, we would be in big trouble. I mean, I'm so grateful for all of them and what they do coming to work every day and build these beautiful drums. It's awesome. Yeah. Paul, thank you so much for showing us around this really cool factory, seeing how everything's done, because we wanted to discover what that great Gretsch sound is, where it comes from, and we found it here. Thank you. Well, thank you. And it comes from all the people putting their DNA all over those drums. Most definitely. You heard it from Paul. It's the people. Their unbridled commitment to an uncompromising vision of premium sound is matched only by their passion and world-class craftsmanship. With generations of experience reverberating in every Gretsch USA drum. That's what elicits the great Gretsch sound. We uh, compliment uh, Team Sweetwater and, and, and Chuck Serac for, for developing a model that has stood the test of time and, 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 and the team today continues to grow stronger by add, adding top people from around the industry. Personal recollections, uh, having uh, in the 135th anniversary year, five years ago, be, being at the uh, Gear Fest and, and, and taking part in that. Uh, uh, some of the high points over the years, uh, introducing Steve Ferroni as he did a clinic there at, at Sweetwater. Also introducing Chuck Serac and his band as, as they played for a rousing audience at Gear Fest uh, there. And, 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 and what a rush that was. Uh, uh, the, the crowd, the excitement, and, and Chuck and his band and, and, and their virtuosity. Is there one thing that, in the way that Gretsch makes drums that will, they will never change? Uh, the, yeah, the one thing okay. that w will never change is the high quality of the of sound that you get out of the instruments. Uh, so so we, we, we may tweak a little here and there right. to, to improve things around the edges. And, and as uh, materials change over time, become more or less available, uh, uh, we're, 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 we're going to keep in the best sounding uh, by, by uh, 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 making those little changes along the way that, that are uh, probably imperceptible, but uh, keep the quality of sound right at the highest level. Well, what a way to end the day. We had a fantastic time at the Gretsch factory, and now Paul decided to invite us to his home. Man, this, there's some amazing gear. It's sitting in front of this kit right here and just hearing the sound of it. Yeah. I mean, it was really special. So what, what's going on with this old guy here? Well, it's a 1947 broadcaster kit. Bought it on eBay for $900, and it was in complete disrepair. So after I fixed it and had it set up, uh, that's what made me really want to bring the three-ply drums back, and that's why we introduced Broadcaster in 2014. Wow. It was based on just how I thought this kit sounded. It sounded so good. But well, it really does sound yeah. good. Yeah. And it's powerful. And the fact that it's that old and still sounds that powerful is amazing. It's a good one. Yeah. What else you got? Well, what are some of the stuff? You got so many great things here. I got uh, 1964, and this was actually, they called it a Renown kit at the time. I think the retail price on it at that point was probably $300. Wow. Okay. Right? Uh, great sounding kit, unbelievable kit drum. Got a bunch of 70s and 80s uh, walnut drums. Got a 125th anniversary Millennium Maple kit. 135th anniversary ribbon mahogany dark emerald kit. Got this. Uh, this is kind of a bluish Caribbean blue bird's eye kit. That those were some shells left over from our uh, 130th anniversary. Gorgeous. Got a river cypress kit over here. Got more 70s walnut antique maple. I've got a concert toms that used to be Taylor Hawkins. And uh, I've got a 49 kit over in the corner. Plenty what, of drums. Yeah, a <laughs> good amount of drums. And then the wall of snares. 
Just all kinds of snare. I just love snare drums. I don't sure. think we can ever have enough. What's the oldest snare drum you have here? Uh, the oldest one here on the shelf. This guy's a 60s. Uh, well, this is 60s as well. Um, most of the rest of them, well, actually, this is 1953, so that's the oldest oh, guy. Oh, okay, there you yeah. go. Well, Paul, thanks so much. Thank it's you. It's a great way to end the Thank day. you for coming. Checking out your collection, playing these drums a little bit. It's super inspiring. Thanks so much, man. Uh, you're welcome anytime. Appreciate it. We've had a blast hanging out with the good folks at Gretsch. If you'd like to learn more about Gretsch's incredible array of drums and more, then check out Sweetwater.com or call your Sweetwater sales engineer.